Welcome to Writing Westward. I'm your host, Brendan Redsing. Today we speak with three authors, Ken Dewey, Dan O'Brien, and Larkin Powell, about their books Great Plains Weather, Great Plains Bison, and Great Plains Birds, all part of the University of Nebraska Press's series, Discover the Great Plains. Let me take a quick moment to explain a bit about the podcast and who produces it. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. For better or worse, it's a one-man operation with me, Brennan Rensink, playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, and everything else. I'm associate director of the Red Center and an associate professor of history at BYU, neither of which roles trained me for the current task. But I do have a lot of fun doing this because I'm passionate about better understanding the North American West, the region I have called home for most of my life. In each Writing Westward episode, I have a conversation with writers of the region, academics, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, anyone authoring anything about the West. My goal is that these conversations will spark listeners' curiosity to dig in a bit more themselves and think differently about the peoples, histories, environments, ideas, and identities that make up the North American West or that we ascribe to the region. Please leave reviews or comments on whatever platform you are listening and let me know if we're succeeding. For updates or communication, please follow Writing Westward on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast or on Twitter at Writing West. You can find all episodes on our website, writingwestward.org, or listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or most all major podcast distribution platforms, apps, and services. To learn more about the BYU Red Center, Stay tuned, and at the end of the episode, I'll offer some additional information about our projects, programming, live-streamed lectures, funding opportunities for research, and events. Find the center at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D Center. For more regular updates, you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at BYU Red Center. Now, let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. In fact, I should say today's guests. This episode may run a little bit long as we are featuring three books and three authors. Over the past few years, the University of Nebraska Press, through their Bison Books imprint, has been publishing a new book series entitled Discover the Great Plains. I will admit that Writing Westward has not paid sufficient attention to the region, so I thought that featuring a few of these titles would be appropriate. In addition to the volumes we discussed today, the series also includes books on Great Plains Indians, geology, literature, and politics. The books are brief, they're quick reads, and aimed at general audiences. But the authors are experts in their fields, and in these treatments they provide excellent introductions to all of their topics. They provide in-depth information and data, alongside narrative stories, wonderful illustrations, and so forth. The books are just great. This Discover the Great Plains series is a template that I hope other presses will adopt, an interdisciplinary series on region that is both easy to access and easy to consume. Today, we have brief individual conversations with the three authors about their contributions, and I will introduce each of them in turn. First is Ken Dewey, and we'll speak about his 2019 book, Great Plains Weather. Dewey is Professor Emeritus of Geography and Climatology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. He maintains the Lincoln Weather and Climate website and even provides regular weather segments on local Nebraska radio station KLIN. Professor Ken Dewey, welcome to Riding Westward. And thank you for inviting me. I'm really excited uh, about this episode, talking with you and a couple others about this book series with Nebraska Press, Discover the Great Plains. Uh, I think that this kind of regional publishing, interdisciplinary from all angles and approaches is just really great. And I would love to see other presses uh, follow suit. It's a, it's a great project. Um, I did want to open, I just saw today on my Twitter feed, maybe I'll actually see if I can rotate my webcam around here. Listeners won't be able to see this, but someone just posted about this cold front that is about to slam down onto the western plains and it look I looked up a few places in the Nebraska panhandle and it looks like temperatures are going to go from about 101 on Saturday down to the mid 20s by Tuesday night. Um I think that's a great introduction uh, to our topic of weather and really great plains uh, extreme weather. Of course it is. This is this is why I wrote the book 
when I started to write the book, I wrote it as a textbook. And then the editor said, no, tell your stories, make it become alive. So the book is filled with facts and tables and charts and maps, but the stories are amazing. And I start the book with the concept of the Great Plains. There's two ways you can describe this in a single sentence. One sentence would be, it's not normal to be normal on the Great Plains. Because normal is what you would expect, but in reality, our average or normal is a blend of extremes. Like you just said, 100 degrees, a few days later, snow. I've also explained that our weather on the Great Plains is the heartland of extremes. And there's only one other place on planet Earth that's actually more extreme than the Great Plains, and that's Siberia. So wow. we, we have to give people credit who choose to live in the Great Plains and then don't want to leave. They embrace this incredible <laughs> change that can take place hour to hour, day to day, month to month, year to year. So we really truly are the Great Plains, a place of the heartland of extremes. And when I wrote the book, it was an opportunity for me to tell my stories of what I've seen on the Great Plains and then to tell the stories of others that are hidden in the history of the Great Plains of incredible weather and climate events that have taken place. Some we know and some many people don't know. Well, maybe this is a case of uh, Stockholm Syndrome. People on the Great Plains have uh, become so abused by this hard weather, they just come eventually to embrace it and uh, to make it part of their core identity, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I ha I do know that I showed students from time to time longevity maps for the United States. It's a, a really great geography example of what's the, you know, how, what's the average age of people and how long do you live? And actually the place to be is the Great Plains. This is where people have, we have the most number per capita of people above 90 years old and above 100 years old. And then I looked at the students and I said, you want to know what the number one reason that finally people die out in the Great Plains. And I said, they're just exhausted from all the extreme <laughs> weather and climate that happens. But yes, it's, it, it, maybe it's because we're beaten into submission and we just expect this. On my social media the last couple of days, I saw phrases like, well, what do you expect? This is September in the Great Plains. This is September in Nebraska. So we live the longest out here on the Great Plains. Maybe a little bit of, you know, we need this to keep us, I guess, mentally active because we're constantly paying attention. What if we lived in a horribly boring place like Hawaii where you wake up one morning and you go, you know, it's just the same old, same old. I'm done. I'm checking out of here. But in the Great Plains, I wonder what this winter is going to be like. And I tell you, other than sports on the Great Plains, people talk about weather, not only the current weather, but it's legends of things that have happened in the past. And, they, and if I put something on my social media, they'll say, I remember my dad telling me about that. I remember my grandmother telling me about that. So people do love the fact that they endure these extremes, and they almost take it with a badge of honor. Very much so. Uh, we, when we moved there, uh, my wife was from Phoenix, and uh, she now wears her nine years of surviving Nebraska winters as a badge of honor. Uh, and when people here in Utah complain about, oh, it's so cold, she says, no, 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 no. Uh, these Utah winters are quite balmy and mild uh, compared to what we uh, what we lived through. Um, I wanted to go back to um, 1974. You share this great story about when you first went to the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and your aunt Barbara, you write, says, and I'll quote I'll quote you here as you were paraphrasing her. She said, "Are you sure you want to go to Nebraska? Don't they?" Don't they have blizzards, tornadoes, heat waves, tornadoes, dust bowls, cold waves, and tornadoes there? Uh, to which you responded, yes, that's exactly why I'm going. This is the first chapter in the book is called The Road to Nebraska. Uh, and it exactly highlights why as a little kid, I loved weather in Chicago. That's where I saw my first tornado at 10 years old. And in the book, I, I give a brief statement of my parents were so put off by my getting so excited about the storm approaching, they said, look, we've got company over. Go upstairs to your room and then come down later. I was excited because it was a better view from up there. And I went up there and saw a tornado approaching our house in Chicago. And then the next day, my dad came home from work and he had a newspaper in his hand. And he said in a very stern voice, but I knew he wasn't mad at me. 
get into the car. So I got into the car and he drove me a half a mile away and showed me the tornado damage and then handed the newspaper to me. And there was a Chicago Tribune pictures of the tornado damage that had taken place. I was so impressed at what the atmosphere could do. And I called it at that time an atmospheric tantrum. That was my introduction to extreme weather. And then I had a choice of many places to live. As a professor, you can teach in any one of the 50 states. I chose Nebraska as my first job, and it was my only job for 46 years, so I could be here to experience firsthand. And by the way, over the years, I began to realize I needed to start photographing it instead of just experiencing it. So as I began my career, I didn't even have a camera. But over the years, I now have, as people know when they see me, a digital camera attached to my hip because I don't want to miss that sunrise, that sunset, the wildlife that come into the backyard where I live. And the final chapter in the book actually talks about it's not called the road to retirement because they wanted to make it be like, what does one do as you near retirement out in the Great Plains? And I give the reasons why you want to remain on the Great Plains. And I talk through how the Pacific Northwest is so cloudy, so rainy, (laughs) so uncomfortable. And then in the summer, it's just kind of like boring and very humid, maybe, but it's still very boring. The Southwest is always brown and rocks and sand and gravel. The Southeast has so many trees, you can't see the sky. The Northeast has a wonderful summer. Sometimes it lasts as long as 10 days. The rest (laughs) of the year is just cloudy and miserable. I say Colorado and the mountainous states are perfect, but they become urban locations. And you go, urban locations? No, they're not. They're mount- No, they're urban locations. In the winter, crowded with people out there for winter sports. And in the summer, crowded with people that want to go camping and hiking and all that. It's really not a place to live, although it's beautiful. Too many people in the summer, too many people in the in the winter. So Nebraska and the Great Plains, for me, was ideal. Because in the Great Plains, the variety is exciting and interesting. If you don't want variety and excitement, you move to a San Diego. You move to Honolulu. You move to Key West, (laughs) Florida. And then I know people say this and they laugh at them. I miss the change of seasons. And then it's like, you know what, they really do. And I have relatives that live in Phoenix. I have relatives that live in Los Angeles. And they say after a while, they actually look at some of my photographs and go, that looks so beautiful, that first snowfall just sitting around the countryside. And that looks so nice. It's just another hot, polluted day here today in Los Angeles. So that's very, very true. My family, on one hand, could not believe I wanted to come here. And they painted it as a negative thing. Why would somebody want to live on the Great Plains? You want to live on the Great Plains because it's probably the most exciting place on planet Earth for weather and climate. I don't think I would encourage the number one place, as I said earlier, Siberia. Siberia. (laughs) That's more extreme than here. But it's pretty darn exciting here. As I mentioned this morning on my radio show, it's going to go 100 degrees. It's going to go down to near freezing. But then it will all settle down later next week and just be near normal again. And this is what happens out here in the Great Plains. It's peaceful. It's quiet. Then all of a sudden you have this tantrum. In the spring, severe weather, in the winter, severe weather, and storms and blizzards and cold waves. So that's exactly why I chose to live here for my career and why I would choose to live here in retirement and claim this is the best place in the United States. Well, you speak as a true convert to the region. I love it. I love it. Although I am a Pacific Northwestern myself, uh, born and raised, so um, I may take a little umbrage with. You know, I've gone to Seattle and I always want to blend in mm-hmm. with the the local people. So I look like a native person and not, you know, a foreigner coming from another state. I've been there multiple times in the winter for a week and it'll be drizzling outside. And then I'll walk out onto the street and I am so proud of the fact no rain gear at all, no umbrella, nothing. And I see people walking around with umbrellas and they go, Shit, they don't belong here. So I fit <laughs> right into the crowd. It's just another drizzly day in Seattle yeah. and you just go out for a walk. And it's, of course, nice in the winter. The lawns are green in the Pacific Northwest, but it's just the persistent clouds and the persistent weather day after day. As a climate historian, I've looked at places like there and, and a place like Seattle can go weeks with the temperature never varying more than just a few degrees. And every hour is cloudy with a little bit of drizzle. And it's like I would just scream if I lived there. <laughs> the monotony would happen. kill you. Huh? Stop the drizzle. <laughs> let's have a thunderstorm and let's do something with this. It's annoying. It's death by a thousand paper cuts. <laughs> 
Well, let's talk about um, let's talk about geography. And let's talk about some weather on the Great Plains. You write um, in the book. You say the Great Plains doesn't own its climate, but it instead borrows heavily from all the climates outside of the region. So, could you offer your kind of quick elevator pitch explanation to uh, to someone who doesn't know much about climate and geography? What is it about the Great Plains geography and the surrounding geographies that create these extreme fluctuations and the extreme weather that the Great Plains has? I have a map uh, inside the book in the first chapter, and it, it says right underneath the map, most areas of the U.S. claim that they own their own climate. For example, Colorado has a mountain climate. New England has a cool, damp maritime climate. The desert southwest has a desert, dry, and hot climate. The Gulf states and Florida, they're a tropical climate. Northern Minnesota actually officially has a patent that says that they can designate themselves as the icebox of the nation. If you were to ask 100 people, what's the climate like in Florida, Hawaii, Colorado, the Pacific Northwest, they all could describe it. But if you were to ask 100 people, even living in the Great Plains, what is the climate of the, of the Great Plains? How would you describe it? They'd go, I don't think I can. And that's because we don't own any climate or air mass. They come at us, as it shows on this map, from all 360 degrees. When the wind's from the north, it gets cold. When the wind's from the south, it gets warm. When the wind's from the desert, it gets dry. When the winds are from the gulf, it gets really wet. So that's why we in Nebraska and we in the Great Plains really don't own a climate because we don't have an, a place where weather and climate take place in terms of it being born. It comes at us on this flat, undulating Great Plains from all directions. And that's part of what makes it so violent, right? When these different air masses, different temperatures and humidities meet and crash over uh, over the plains. It creates some of the most violent weather, right? Right. And you're impressed by the dramatic change that's going to take place um, in just the next few days as we looked at the map in Nebraska. There are examples in the book that I describe where the temperature change is almost 100 degrees. No, not 100 down into the 30s and 40s, 100 degrees from the 70s to 30 below zero in the middle of winter. Can you imagine that? I have a story in there of how people in the early 1900s in Kansas were living in this house that had no air conditioning, no TV, no radio, no way of knowing what was going on. It was spring. The temperature was in the lower to mid 80s. Now, we have data that go way back then, so I, I know that's real. And as they fell asleep that evening, undoubtedly with windows open to let in some of the cool night air, by 10 o'clock, it was snowing inside the windows. As the people woke up, they must have said, is this a dream or is this real? As the temperature dropped from the 80s down to near zero by the next morning with about a foot of snow. These dramatic changes must have been shocking to the Europeans who came and settled the Great Plains. And it's an example of some of these dramatic changes that can take place. Because as you said, you just have to clash. You get rid of all the warm air, here comes all the cold air. And there are other examples in the book that try to point out Yes, it's not normal here because we don't ever have the average. It's an average of extremes. Yeah, and it can go the opposite direction too, right, with these Chinook winds that can, uh, in the middle of winter, uh, take very low temperatures and you know, can go up 70, 80 degrees in the course of uh, less a half a day or so, right? Oh, less than an hour. Mm -hmm. Up in Spearfish, South Dakota, there is the national record for a temperature change of over 50 degrees. Five zero, not up to 50 degrees, but the temperature went from well below zero to well above zero in just minutes as the Chinook came slack crashing into the area. And then the Chinook eased back and the cold air sloshed, if you will, like a basin of water back into that area. And I have in the book the story of where I was at a meeting in Boulder, Colorado. There was about a foot of snow on the ground. And at eight o'clock at night, I always chose the highest floor at a hotel so I'd have a good view. My colleagues were at the meeting, were knocking on the door, and they said, have you looked outside? And I said, no, not yet. And they said, we're all coming in the room. And six of my friends and colleagues came in. They said, turn off all the lights and open the blinds. And the winds came down and were coming down out of the mountains nearby Boulder, Colorado, roaring to 70, 80 miles an hour. And as we watched, the temperature warmed where it had been below freezing in October all day and all night to suddenly in the 60s and 70s at 10 o'clock at night, and the snow disappeared in about an hour and a half. 
we were so excited and we know that 90% of everybody at that hotel didn't care. Most people would go, oh, well, snow's gone. But for us, a living example of the drama of what it's like to live on the Great Plains, it's not, it's, it's this rapid change. Not only is it a land of extremes, but it's the speed at which these things can happen. I was struck during my time on the plains uh, by these wild fluctuations and also by some of the the real kind of terrifying and humbling violence of Mother Nature of what um, of what weather can be. Uh, we had some you know large hailstorms. Uh, thankfully, you know we never our car or property was never damaged, but also some of the tornado scares. And as someone from the Northwest, that was pretty terrifying. After the first couple warnings, we kind of joined the rest of the people in our apartment building, when the tornado sirens would go off, everyone would go outside instead of down to the basement because everyone wanted to go watch. But um, on the day my first child was born, the uh, funnel clouds came down over the city, and the hospital staff stacked pillows and couch cushions up against the window uh, next to my wife's bed and against the side of the bed, and they turned to me and they said, we're legally obligated to ask you to wait inside the bathroom. Um, you know, as she's giving birth, they, they couldn't force me to do it. Um, but we like to tease our daughter, you know, that she came into the world with quite a bang. You know, the heavens were displeased with her coming. Um, but, but these moments of, uh, of the violence of weather, uh, and for a lot of people in the country, weather is something that is just there and it affects their life, but it, it doesn't have that, uh, that raw power that, uh, suddenly makes you feel so small, um, and, was uh, this in Nebraska you're talking this about? Was, this was in Lincoln, Lincoln, Nebraska, right. yeah. I wrote the book four years ago, and the irony of it was I was writing the chapter explaining that uh, the first tornado that I had seen in Chicago, and I wasn't paying any attention to the weather at all that day. I was, because it's so changeable, I sometimes don't even look at the forecast. It started out warm and humid, it was May, and then the next thing I know, I hear a tornado siren going and going, what's this all about? So I went upstairs in my house and I looked out and there was a tornado approaching my neighborhood. And I have a picture of that tornado in the book. And then pretty soon hail began to fall. The hailstorm lasted an hour. The hail became large enough that it was going through the roofs of the houses nearby. And I have a picture in the book that shows the hole in the roof of my next door neighbor's house. It hit a care facility about a couple, maybe two or three blocks from my house. It was breaking the windows and the staff was rapidly moving the people, some of whom, there was a man in there who had his leg amputated. He had been in a motorcycle accident. They have four people trying to carry him from his bed with the, with the floor covered with water and broken glass to get him to safety. As the storm, an hour earlier, the sky was blue, hot and humid, and now we had hail falling the size of grapefruit. And it was smashing through the roofs of houses and breaking windows everywhere. And this is how it can be frightening. For me, I, of course, grab my camera and I start taking pictures. But for other people, it's very scary. When I first moved to Lincoln and finally got a camera, I remember going outside during all the tornado warnings to see the pictures. And I didn't realize how my example could be bad because there was one time my battery was low in the camera. So I left the street and went running back into my house to change my battery my neighbors told me that when they saw me running into the house, they all knew it was real and they went for cover. <laughs> they didn't know that I was back out in two minutes with fresh batteries in my camera. I wasn't running for cover. I was just getting some more batteries. So what you described as how dramatic it was for your daughter when she was born, when my daughter, was, our youngest daughter was born in 1976, we had a violent thunderstorm at about five in the morning and she was born at about six. And the day before, we had had snow on the ground, and now we had thunderstorms at 5 in the morning. I remember running in and out of the room, and it was the beginning of when fathers could be in the birthing room. And I would run down the hallway, take a look at the storm that was coming, all excited. I'd run back to the room, all excited <laughs> to, to see the birth. And then finally, the nurse was agitated and said, are you going to be here for the birth? This is not a scheduled performance. And my wife turned to her and said, just just let him be <laughs> because the, it was an exciting moment. Here's the birth of my first daughter. At the same moment, there is a violent spring, February, thunderstorm going on with snow on the ground outside. And, I, and my attention was split between the two two events. One thing I appreciate about, appreciate about your book is uh, that you do frame a lot of this in stories, uh, right, and in narratives. And 
um, which is how I think most people will be able to connect with, with the topic of thinking about weather. Uh, and one of the things that struck me again about kind of this violent weather is, um, you know, we have these these stories, you know, from uh, the 19th century and, uh, you know, weather is weather and it comes and it goes, but some of these really violent events, you can start to see why people describe them as acts of God because, you know, yes, out of nowhere, there's this huge thunderstorm in February or there's grapefruit sized hail uh, when it was blue and sunny a few uh, minutes earlier. It, it does seem to come out of nowhere if you're not a scientist who understands the dynamics of what's going on. So do you think that, um, you know, modern uh, forecasting and modeling does allow us to uh, predict these things a lot better, to predict where and when tornadoes may occur, when there may be hailstorms? How do you think that changes Great Plains residents' uh, relationship with the natural world and with weather? The, the fact that we are able to kind of scientifically uh, predict and and make things less, perhaps a little bit less scary. Well, I talk about being a storm chaser and how I started out really just being a storm photographer. But over the years of being a storm chaser, I would leave in the morning and go out and do some photography. Now, many years later, in our car, we have live radar in the dashboard of my car. And we have live radar on our iPads and our phones, and we know where all the storms are. The technology keeps us much more alert in what's going on. And in many ways, I think people are very distracted, and sometimes they don't pay any attention to this. I abhor the statement that I hear in the media. We had no idea this hurricane was coming. Well, you have no idea because you just weren't paying any attention. I had that my whole life. I'd have students. I had no idea this was going to be on the test. Well, you should have been paying attention. <laughs> Let me give you an example of what you're talking about, of how life has changed. Imagine the Mormon Trail and imagine the, tra uh, the people walking across the Great Plains. Only a few people were actually in the wagons. I have a story in there that comes out of the diaries that were in the State Historical Society. And one wagon train was about an hour behind another wagon train. And as they approached Fort Kearney, they noticed that there were some animals and they were laying on their side and they were dead and they're going wonder what happened and then they get closer and closer to the fort and the comment that they made is we saw men walking about and they had claws around their head clothing in other words pieces of clothing around their head and they had blood but there were no piercings and they don't mean piercings like you know people would get today a nose ring they meant they were cons they didn't have any native americans or indians that had attacked them so they didn't have piercings for their bleeding what had happened and as they approached then the camp they noticed that the wagons they, they were shredded they, and they then heard about these big balls of ice that had fallen from the sky so in these stories that i read in the historical archives that were buried forever but as i had them emerge to the, the light of today, can you imagine the early settlers? And they came from all these European locations, and they were they left St. Louis, and now they're crossing Nebraska, and they encountered for the first time a tornado, a hailstorm, and they didn't know what this was. Yet some of them chose to stay. And that's why you see throughout the Great Plains, ethnically related Swedish and Russian and Polish and, and German and so forth, neighborhood, neighborhoods, but communities where people said, I can deal with this. Can you imagine living on the Great Plains? And they would have these cycles of dust bowls and then floods. There's stories of their real data, the 1950s, the worst dust bowl, actually more than the 30s for the state of Nebraska. And at the peak of the dust bowl, there was the worst flood that Nebraska ever had. And as they were rescuing people along the Republican River, visibility was reduced from the yellowish, reddish dust that was blowing in from Kansas. So they're having a dust storm. They've had violent thunderstorms. And then there's a tornado approaching as they're rescuing these people. And you know what they did the next day? They went on. So here are people in southwest Nebraska, flash floods, killing people during a dust storm from a drought in the area during a thunderstorm producing tornadoes that are passing over the same area. So yes, they must have wondered why was the wrath of God so horrible? And I put in the book, you remember the Wizard of Oz, my goodness, Toto, I don't think we're in Nebraska anymore. <laughs> or not Nebraska, I think. You remember in the book 
Um, Dorothy said to Toto, my goodness, Toto, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. I said the people in the wagon trains, the early settlers moving across the, the United States must have clicked their heels together, looked at each other and said, my goodness, I don't think we're in Europe anymore. Because our climate, our weather is exactly the opposite of what you expect in Europe, a very moderate, slowly changing day to day weather pattern. Well, I think. This was such a great addition to the Discover the Great Plains um, book series that, that uh, University of Nebraska Press is doing. I think thinking about uh, weather as a lens through which to not just view the region and the land and uh, the science of it all, but also to view human stories. I think it is fascinating. It is something that is ubiquitous in all of our lives, but often goes uh, unthought about. We don't, we don't think about it. And so um, I appreciate your contribution to this series. I think it was great and full of just really uh, fascinating, fascinating stories. Well, I think the stories is how I, as a professor, I thought that students could learn more if I put things into a story context. So that's why I think the book, to me, has been successful. And one other comment, as I did the research, for example, I found in 1931 in March, this is the connection to today's school buses. There was a school bus disaster where a school bus a ramshackled vehicle that they used got stranded in a blizzard, and one by one, the children began to die. And I cannot imagine the terror that the people were in. When they were eventually rescued, about half the kids died, half of them lived. They were invited to Washington, D.C., where, believe it or not, Congress and Senate 100% agreed, we need to do something about this. And they then created the National School Bus Standards. So a violent blizzard unexpected out here on the Great Plains in the 1930s is why you see school buses going down the road and they're yellow. Isn't that neat to make a historical connection to, well, I wonder why all the buses are yellow. Well, in 1931, they had a disaster that got national attention that a school bus with no standards was stranded in a snowstorm and children began to die and they realized we needed to have a national school bus standard. And that's why today you see numbers painted on the top, they're bright yellow, and they all have communication to some central location in case they get stranded in a drift or they slide off the road or they encounter deep water and they're stuck in the water. So these sometimes disasters that we see actually have good things that came out of them. And I think that's the important story that I want to give. It's not all just scary, scary, horrible stuff that happened. It's dramatic things that happened. And from that, we've learned how to create better and safer environments and how to better withstand the storms, while at the same time, for those who like a variety of weather, there's no place on earth like the Great Plains. <laughs> well, thank you for your time, Ken. I really appreciate this. I love your enthusiasm and your love for the region, and it's infectious and contagious, and I think it's great. So thank you for uh, spending a little time with us today. I appreciate it. Next, a conversation with ecologist, author, and rancher Dan O'Brien about his 2017 book in the series, Great Plains Bison. O'Brien has had a varied career as a wildlife biologist, novelist, essayist, educator, and now rancher. He runs the Wild Idea Buffalo Company, raising buffalo in South Dakota with an eye towards preserving and restoring Great Plains grasslands. Dan O'Brien, thank you for joining us today on Riding Westward. It's a pleasure to be here, Brendan. I look forward to getting to talk to you. I am very excited about uh, the University of Nebraska Press's Discover the Great Plains series. Uh, when I saw those first coming out, I thought it was such a great idea to have these regional, a regionally focused series. And I mean, the first one I saw was David Wishart's um, Great Plains Indians, and you know, I, I'm friends with David, and I was excited to see that. But then I started, as they started coming out, I noticed, oh, they're doing stuff from all kinds of different disciplines and approaches, and I just think it's it's such a great project. Yeah, and and I, you know, I agree with you 100%. I think it was a great idea. They got some good people to do it, starting with David, who also a friend of mine. Uh, but I just want to say that working with the University of Nebraska Press, I've been at this a long time, and they're just about as easy to work with and as bright as anybody I've ever worked with in New York. It's a great, great outfit. Yep. They have a manuscript of mine right now, just waiting to get the reader reports back. So I'm, I've been a long, t long time fan. And I did my graduate work in Lincoln. So I, I've known people there at the press for a while. They're, they they put out great stuff. And this is on the Bison Brook Books imprint, um, which uh, puts out a lot of great stuff, especially kind of for like general readership. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe we could start with terminology. 
Um, the species we're talking about is the American bison, but as most people know, uh, most people say buffalo. Um, can you explain to us kind of the history behind this misnomer or how this how this situation came to be? Well, as near as I can track it down, uh, you know, when Europeans came over here, they misnamed a lot of things <laughs> like Indians, yep. buffalo. And, and I think that they this was all new to them. And so they just named them whatever they knew that was close. And, of course, they knew Cape Buffalo and Water Buffalo and that kind of stuff. So uh, it, it is definitely a misnomer. It should be bison. We around this ranch and our business uh, call them buffalo because that's what our neighbors, the Lakota, call them. Uh, you very, very seldom hear an Indian, a uh, Native American call a bison a mm. bison it's always buffalo always buffalo and where is your so, ranch located well it's we are right on the cheyenne river between the badlands and the black hills okay and i'm looking out the window right now and i can see the edge of pine ridge reservation we our ranch runs right up against pine ridge for about eight miles so we, we have a lot of neighbors a lot of friends and then in our meat business, we have a lot of native people working in there because there's a, you know, there's a affinity for, between natives and buffalo that uh, it makes for good workers. Well, I know, uh, I know they can be a difficult species, uh, bison, to, to ranch and to handle. I have a, a friend out uh, in central Nebraska whose dad, for some reason, decided he wanted to get a couple bison and he got a couple bison he named one of them after his wife which i don't think she appreciated very much but uh apparently they were just nothing but trouble uh they are i mean what always uh, surprises me we have um there's bison herds on antelope island up um outside of salt lake actually a, a friend of mine just last week was um was killed by a bison on antelope island he was was out trail running and he was gored and died in the hospital well, it's interesting. In, in one of my earlier books, Buffalo for the Broken Heart, it was early in my association with buffalo. And, and my I'm not a scientist, so my solution to the to the genetics problem was get buffalo from as many places as possible. And, you know, probably uh, you're, that's probably as good as you can do without being a real uh, genome type scientist. And so I got some of the buffalo from Antelope Island. Oh. Been there and loaded up a load, like 20 or so, and brought them this way. So some of my herd are from Antelope Island. I know that well. And so now the interbreeding, you have a pretty diverse genetic stock. Yeah, I mean, that's what I did. Yeah. And we we don't keep really real close track of genetics. You know, we our whole philosophy with the way we raise buffalo is let the buffalo be buffalo. Let let them make the decisions on who breeds who. And, uh, and and I know it's kind of a primitive way of management, but uh, sometimes those primitive ways are better than poking them and jabbing them and that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, and they don't like to be poked and jabbed. I'm always surprised by the kind of the hulking enormity of of a buffalo versus, you know, a cow or something. They are just they you are know, huge animals. <laughs> it's very really interesting. but they look bigger, but they're really not. Really? Maybe it's just yeah. those big, tall shoulders in the front. They're just so imposing, yeah. the hump. And their rump is thin, so it makes them look real muscular, and they have all that hair on the front end. Mm -hmm. You know, a big bull will weigh 2,000 pounds. Well, a, a, a big Angus bull will weigh 2,000 pounds, yeah. and about 1,000 for a, for the cows. So and it's it's about the same, you know. Mm. I don't want to put it in one other thing about handling buffalo. It's not that they're so difficult to handle. They're just different. And, you know, almost everybody that gets into buffalo has been had some experience with cattle. And if you try to do it like cattle, you're, you're going to have some issues. It's got to be a little different than that. Well, let's uh, rewind the clock and move back to the 19th century, you know, and kind of quickly visit this time when – Buffalo were really maybe the defining species uh, of of the Great Plains. 
Um, what is it about, what was it about the Great Plains ecology or topography or climate that allowed this species to become so prolific, so dominant for such a large region? Well, and again, I'm not a scientist, but this was, is my take on it. You know, when, when they came across the land bridge up uh, along the Bering Strait, they were a little different species, hadn't quite evolved to what we know as bison. But when they came across, this was virgin country, and it was endless grasslands. I mean, grasslands clear from Indiana to Salt Lake, and, uh, and there was nothing really on it. A big grazer, and so they just got here and really proliferated. And you know, by the time white men got here, they, uh, you know, they were very much established. And they are, you know, not only a keystone species, but they are uh, just by sheer numbers, they were uh, really, really a player on, in North America, and still are in a lot of ways. You know. Um, they, you know, they've not only made an impact on the land, uh, a huge impact on the land. The land has evolved to to be grazed by buffalo, and but it's they've also made an impact on our psyche and in our our uh, uh, the whole idea of being American. Uh, you know, really has to do with bison and the, being able to travel and the strength and out on the plains by yourself and blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, it's it's all there. Maybe they'd be better than the bald eagle, perhaps, as a, a national symbol, the American <laughs> bison. Probably. Of course, when when they decided uh, on the, you know, the bald eagle, which, as I understand it, was uh, you would know this, but. But I think Benjamin Franklin was uh, was just, he was voting for the turkey. Yeah. Seems, but they didn't really know much about bison then, you know. I mean, they there were a few bison way east, but when they got across the Mississippi Missouri rivers, bang, there were hundreds of thousands of them. Yeah. You know, millions of them. And uh, so you know, I think you know that was a couple hundred years after we chose the eagle. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's always surprising. You can come across accounts of bison yeah, in very surprising places in Virginia. You know, they, they were all over. But when they come out to the plains, the the size of the herds is something else. It's one of these many species that lead, led to this myth of super overabundance. You know, there are so many bison, there's no way that we could ever yeah. hunt them all out. Or there's so many trees. There's so many, you know, passenger pigeons. Um, the the enormity of some of these species was uh was really surprising to a lot of to yeah, a lot of Europeans I mean, and Americans as they came west. A- absolutely, and and you know what we found out that there was no limit to the ignorance of the Europeans that came over. You know? Yeah, we gotta we gotta own that. Yep, you write about the day uh, January first, eighteen sixty two, uh, which was a an important historic moment. I want to just quote here really quick from what you write. Um, this is the day that the, the Homestead Act of 1862 uh, is passed and also um, uh, emancipation. You write, on the same day that 3 million black men and women gained their freedom, perhaps 30 million buffalo lost theirs. In the next 48 years, 80 million acres would be transformed from one functioning sustainable ecosystem to thousands of nonsensical political units operated by men with little experience in land management and almost no real knowledge of the Great Plains. It really is striking, the political transformation that plays out over the plains, and then the fact that the effect that has on ecology, on wildlife. This enormous ecosystem then being divided up, you know, for yeoman farmers. You know, it's, uh, you know, that date... And that story that you just told, which is in that book, but it's huge to me because, you know, I'm an ecologist. And when you step out on the Great Plains, like right outside my door, it, there's grass and there's the aura of buffalo. And that's what drove me to get into the buffalo business was to make that aura a reality. Uh, and, and knowing full well, I'm not really a romantic about it. I don't think the buffalo are going to come back anytime soon. Uh, 
but we can do the best we can. And, you know, we have on this ranch now, we have about a thousand buffalo and, and you get out there and it seems enormous, but it's just a pinhead compared to what it originally was. Yeah. And, and, and when you when you think about that, it's not just the buffalo, it's the grass, it's the birds, it's the other species, and it's the way they all work together, the hydrology. I mean, it, there's really a lot of things out there. I talked with the Ozona podcast yesterday with the Audubon Society, and, and you know, we started talking about grass and birds and, and different species of birds. And finally, I just had to call time out and say, guys – there's really only one thing here. It's all the same thing and it's broken, you know. And when, you know, Lewis and Clark came out here, it wasn't broken yet. And it was one thing. Well, the numbers are really staggering, aren't they? We go from tens of millions of bison. Um, and then you lay it out in chapters as successive waves of how their numbers are reduced. Um, with uh, commercial hide hunters in the 1860s and 70s on the southern plains, the next decade that moves up to the northern plains and is very much paired with the strategies to subdue uh, Native Americans by reducing bison herds. Um, we have some of these pictures of, you know, th these mountain pyramids of bison skulls, uh, and some of the tales that come out of people just hanging out of trains, you know, shooting as many as they could. It, the wholesale slaughter of its pretty shocking but at the nadir um we get down to just a few hundred don't we yeah and that that number is is pretty soft i mean nobody was really studying them which is a remarkable thing that they were almost gone probably the guess is down to about 400 individuals from you know maybe 30 million or something like that and that and we're talking about I don't know, 20 years. And that's a, a miraculous feat. I mean, that's a lot of pounds of buffalo and fur and hides and and tough winters and all kinds of the history of the Great Plains is wrapped up in those 20 years because that, you know, it, everything that was here was changed. And, and a lot of it was not done uh, with much grace. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's what makes it kind of hard to try to tease apart the impact that the removal of Buffalo had on these ecosystems. It's hard to, to understand that because simultaneously there were so many other factors in play, right? With farming, irrigation, railroads, you know, there's so many yeah. other things that happened at the same time. Exactly. And, and, Often when you dig into it, and you know this better than I do, they're connected. You know, I mean, the Civil War in Buffalo, yeah, it was a big deal. They had a lot, you know, you know, yet, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand soldiers all of a sudden one day with nothing to do, and you got 30 million buffalo standing out there, the shit's going to hit the fan. Excuse the <laughs> church. You, know? you talk in the book a little bit about agriculture, about you know, really the problem with our, you know, agribusiness uh, models, uh, monocrop um, agriculture that, you know, causes a lot of problems, say, with there, there's not enough nitrogen fixing plants anymore, you know, in the ecosystem to replenish the soil. So we have to use fertilizer and you know, these things just pile up and there's these domino effects that, you know, eventually affect not just the land, but affect the uh, the surface water affect the Oglala aquifer uh, water, which an enormous region depends on um, for groundwater. But as as you look at all of this, what do you what do you turn to for answers? You, you strike a somewhat hopeful tone in the book. Um, so so where are you looking for answers or for resistance or for ways to solve uh, some of these linked problems? Well, I you know and. A lot of my life is taken up, and probably yours too, with trying to figure out how to right these wrongs. And I think that I started out, you know, as a kid biologist, and, you know, we were so, this is in the 70s, 80s, we were so concentrated on, I worked for 14 years on the peregrine falcon as a species, bringing 
you, we didn't want to lose that species. We did not want to lose that species. And so millions of dollars were spent and hundreds, thousands probably of lives like mine were impacted by, by trying to save this species. And it dawned on me one day that this is crazy. This, you know, single species biology is a fool's errand. It's not about the individual. Uh, and it's about the ecosystem. And when you talk about ecosystems on the Great Plains, you're only going to think another 30 seconds till you get to Buffalo. And, you know, the, the ecosystem, and I'm particularly interested in birds, uh, all those things, direct line to, to Buffalo and grazing. Uh, and as far as, as industrial agriculture is concerned, I am uh, very much against industrial agriculture. I think it's crooked. I, I think that basically we're uh, borrowing from our kids to make cheap food today, and it's going to catch up with us. And that's what we try to do here on what we're doing here in South Dakota is, is you know, we – the carbon in the soil, the health of the grasslands, the species makeup of the grasslands – the birds, the animals, the buffalo, the people, you know, that's all one thing. And if we can use, make those things healthy, that's worth something. It's, it's, it's me, it's my life. Okay. But, but it's worth something. And what ha what has happened is industrial agriculture has got a hold of all those factors and try to Gum a little bit of profit off of each one, and that profit comes right out of your kids' enjoyment and their understanding of the world they live in. And uh, that bill is going to come due. Yeah. It's coming. It's coming due right now. And you talk about the Ogaro Aquifer. My God, how it's an incredible, incredible story. I mean, there's uh, there's places down in the Southern Plains where uh, the water table has dropped. You know, a hundred feet. There's places where they they can't draw anymore. There's counties that they have official like zero draw policies that they don't even pull out of yeah. the aquifer anymore because it's it's shrinking. It's gone. Well, it's, well, I go down to New Mexico, Texas line every summer or every winter, and uh, I do some bird hunting down there. And I can remember even in the 40 years I've been going down there, that I can remember uh, playas that were full of ducks, full of cranes full of, you know, all kinds of shorebirds, and now they're dry. Yeah. And, hell, they're plowing them and growing cotton in them, which we don't need. We don't need. We have to subsidize it. And what did that cost? Well, it's, it's going to cost in the future as well, perhaps. Well, that's why I appreciate about your book is you tell, not, you tell this history of bison and the history of the region – through this, these stories of bison, um, but this ecological perspective of, you know, bison alone aren't the answer. Peregrine falcons alone aren't the answer. But bison are a species through which that we can use as a lens through which to view um, how these regions and ecosystems used to work, how they work now, how they don't work now, and then especially the um, the the impacts and the connections that this species in particular has with people and the stories and relationships that people have with it. Um, and for a region like the Great Plains, uh, the, you know, bison, it's just such a, an iconic species. I think it's good for us to pause and to, to think about them alongside the many, many other environmental issues uh, that, that the Great Plains are having to think about right now. Well, in, in bison, really, I mean, they're a metaphor for the Great Plains. It just, it's all there in that story, and it's it's an amazing story. Uh, there's a new book just, and I'm sure it's out, but I, anyway, I was asked to blurb it, and it's called uh, Nature's Mirror, and it's it's about taxidermy, and you think taxidermy, what the who cares, you know? But it, it's anyway, I recommend the book. Uh, but it talks a lot. There's a whole chapter about buffalo and uh, Hornaday's uh, really his efforts to uh, preserve them in some way. And it looked like for a long time they were going to be preserved only as 
stuffed species. Hmm, interesting. I just pulled this up by Mary Ann Andre, Nature's Mirror, How Taxidermists Shaped America's Natural History Museums and Saved Endangered Species. Wow, oh, interesting. Read it, man. I yeah, tell you, yeah. it was kind of, I don't know, blurb this book around. <laughs> But, well, I'm I'm always looking for new books to go pick yeah. up. That's what this podcast is all about. So it's an excuse for me to read books. <laughs> uh, Dan, I I appreciate you spending a few minutes with us to talk about this, and I'm excited to you know recommend this book uh, and the whole series to people. I hope podcast listeners will will pick them up and learn a little more about the uh, Great Plains and to kind of think about how do you think about region in interdisciplinary ways. I think it's exciting stuff. Well, and, and thank you, Bren, for for what you're doing and pushing these actually obscure books and obscure publishing places uh, because it's, it's very important, especially in this day of blockbuster uh, novels and huge uh, publishing houses. I mean, you are doing, you're doing God's work, right? <laughs> well, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much, Dan. Okay. Take care. Finally, we talk with Larkin Powell professor of wildlife ecology at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, about his 2019 book, Great Plains Birds. Powell's research ranges from quantitative methods for determining wildlife demographics, wildlife and ecology policy and decision-making, the environmental histories of the Great Plains, and even poetry. Professor Larkin Powell, welcome to Writing Westward. It's great to be here with you today. I appreciate you taking some time out of your early semester schedule to talk with us a little bit about your book and to talk about birds and the Great Plains. No, this is always fun and I really enjoy it. I mentioned earlier uh, to you that I lived in Nebraska for quite a few years and um, you opened your book I'm um, talking about uh, as a young college student witnessing the Sandhill Crane migration out by Kearney, Nebraska. Uh, I lived there for a couple years and we caught them coming back to roost in the evening once, uh, but we had kids in tow in their pajamas and we couldn't stay long, but it was quite a sight. But this is how you open the book and you say that seeing the sandhill cranes lift up off that river is what really got you hooked and really steered the remainder of your life and career. Can you describe the scene and what was so captivating to you? Sure. And, uh, you know, to, to set it up, my I was a actually at the time I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. So I was in a pre-med biology program and, and, uh, it was spring break and headed out to do something. And my parents kind of gently told me I wasn't going to do what my friends were doing. And my dad, uh, in the book, I kind of make it sound like he kidnapped me to take me out to see the Sand Hill Crane migration. And I think the, there had been an article in the Des Moines Register that they had read about this, uh, pointing people that this would be a good trip. And, and the, it was, so we, we went in the morning, um, on a Audubon tour. And I, I think it was a fairly, at that point, uh, kind of ramshackle blind that they had put together with some hay bales and things. This was way back in the day and, um, maybe the start of ecotourism along the river. But, um, yeah, you're, you're there and you can hear the birds chattering. Um, in the dark, you file into your, this blind as a group, you know, they're hushing you and the guides <laughs> are telling you to be quiet and so we don't spook the birds and. But sandhill cranes are very noisy birds. Yeah, they're just, they're just, and they talk, 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 talk. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're just, they're just, uh, uh, all, all the time chattering to each other as they stand in the river and they've been, been in that river to protect themselves from predators during the night and kind of in, uh, you know, knee high water and they're, um, they're going to take off at some point here when the sun comes up. And as the, you know, the, 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 the sky starts to get a little light and you can start to see the birds that are making the sound out on the river. And that's the point that you start to use more senses than just your, your, uh, ears. And, uh, you can start to make out things. And then as the sun just keeps getting higher and higher, there's even when they come back to the river and when they leave the river, it's kind of the same thing. There's always one brave first bird, right? That decides, okay, it's time. And then as soon as that one either lands in the uh, evening or takes off in the morning, um, the rest of them start to follow and it's just like kind of opening a funnel and they start to, to go up in the sky and, and they don't just fly straight away. They, they kind of wheel around over your head and, and they give you, you know, it, from a, a tourism perspective, it's great because you get, uh, several minutes with these birds and some of them stay around for 15 or 20 minutes more. Um, 
so it, it's quite, you know, the, the, all those birds that were down on the river then suddenly are now up in the volume of air above your head. And it's just, it is the, the sound and the sight. It really is an amazing spectacle to see. What really shocked me was just the, the biomass, just the amount of, right. and again, you know, words and maybe even pictures don't really describe what you witness, but there's just so many birds. Now, I saw it coming in and they kind of rise up out of the fields and then come, you know, back to the river. But I, I would assume in the morning it's a little more striking because you can't quite see what's out there. And then suddenly the, the, this this revelation and they, they lift up and just so much, uh, so many birds in the air. It makes me think of, you know, those old accounts we have uh, from centuries ago of passenger pigeons where right. they say, you know, that a, a single flock would fly overhead and it would take hours and hours for these single flocks to go over. Uh, we don't quite have those sites uh, anymore. Yeah, I think the, uh, the we've, but there are maybe two dynamics that create that uh, large number of birds. The, the first of all is that the river habitat has uh, become, it, it's changed and there's less open sandbars that they need to stand on. And so maybe the birds are concentrated into these areas that are managed for them. But then also sandhill cranes are one of the, uh, success stories, or they're, they're a bird that has responded well to corn uh, being planted on these former prairie lands, uh, because that's a it's a form of uh, nutrition for them, and, and they've done well. And so their population numbers have have edged up over time. And so there's more birds there than when I was out there as a as a kid. And they're in a smaller space, and so <laughs> it really does result in this uh, large group of birds over your head. Yes, yeah, so maybe the spectacle's actually gotten better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh you write uh in the in the book um you write uh, as you cuz kind of speaking of these moments that you you find out there on the great plains and for you specifically with birds um you write as you explore the great plains I invite you to plan for moments like this discover sacred places away from the bustle of humanity feel the power of nature under a flock of whirling snow geese or allow a western meadowlark to serenade you on a sunny prairie slope. The Great Plains is a wonderful place to find surprises to call your own. I mean, you're a scientist. I don't know why you're writing this well, um, but uh, I, <laughs> I really like this. I'm, I, you know, as I said, I lived in Nebraska for nine years, um, but I'm a, I was a native of the Pacific Northwest, which is a very different kind of natural beauty. And I always struggle to describe to people my experience on the plains and the reasons why I've I really did grow to love the Great Plains, but for me, it was often about these more quiet, solitary, uh, and sometimes even very modest moments But that were, that were really powerful, but a lot of it was that you had found something just for you. You know, it wasn't the Grand Tetons, you know, swarming with tourists or these big iconic sites. It was something small and personal, uh, but really, really powerful. Do you find those moments uh, continually as you travel around the plains, as you um, are out birding and out researching? Yeah, I think, and uh, I, I guess you know, uh, continually, uh, maybe punctuated through time. And and but one of the nice things about those moments is that sometimes there are surprises too, and so um, you just never know when you're going to pull over at a rest area or, you know, stop to stretch uh, and get out of the car and have something really interesting happen. Um, and a lot of times it doesn't. And so that maybe it makes those moments more special. And especially in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, kind of being hooked up to, and I'm the, the worst at that too, um, you know, being hooked up to electronic devices. and We're Always connected, um, always connected. Yes. And so, so finding a place that uh, can can get you away from that uh, certainly um, you know maybe it's maybe it's those larger you know maybe the tourist site draws you to Estes Park or the Tetons or to the Sand Hills of Nebraska, um, but then once you're there, making that uh, personal story uh, uh, that's going to be different, and I think that's the nice thing is. The, the the personal uh, each each individual has a their own personal uh, adventure to tell at the end and 
nowadays, sometimes we actually get to see some of those through Instagram, right? People have yeah. those aha moments. They're like, oh, I got to take a picture and share it with the world. Yeah. <laughs> and you just know that behind that picture, there's this little you know, burst of flesh in their face that they were just like, oh my gosh, this is, this is great. <laughs> um, I like talking with scientists a lot because you guys see the world much differently than I do. Um, a few episodes ago, I shared a story about um, that I was trail running with uh, one of our university's plant and wildlife science professors who studied aspen trees. And we were up running in the mountains and he was describing the landscape to me uh, through his eyes as someone who studies aspen trees and, you know, landscapes after fire regeneration. And he was seeing things I simply didn't understand that were there. He was reading the landscape right. differently. And I'm curious, as you travel around the Great Plains, I'm assuming with your eye looking for birds, how do you think that you see the region? And, and we'll actually, we'll talk about birds in a minute here, but how do you see the region kind of more broadly, do you think differently than the rest of us? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'm going to take us out of the Great Plains for just a second. The, the time that this first started was when I was in grad school. I was at the University of Georgia, and I studied wood thrushes, uh, a songbird that's a lot like a robin, except it has a white breast that's got little brown and brownish black dots on it. And um, so they nest like a robin up in trees with those little mud nests. And, and our job was to go out and find these nests. And so just on a daily basis, we would be searching the trees and you develop this search image for a wood thrush nest. And then you can't drive down the interstate or walk down a sidewalk without it. It took me like 10 years to stop searching for wood thrush nests. As you I see walk. them everywhere. Said yeah. That. <laughs> or at least you're like looking for shadows, you know, you're, you're looking for that search image. And, and so now, um, what I'm as I go around the Great Plains, like what I'm thinking is, oh, that would be a really good luck site for a prairie chicken, or you know, you do you do see you you have these kind of things that you've spent a lot of time looking for, or even sounds that you know we we go out in the spring and listen for prairie chickens out in the distance, the males making that, this uh, just incredible noise um, on this their where they inflate their breast and they right kind of sounds like yeah. a, um, from a distance it's, uh, they they make this booming vocalization which from a distance sounds like somebody blowing on a pot bottle uh, kind of from a mile and a half away and so you just you're kind of you don't realize it though that you have that little <laughs> a couple bristles down there in your ear are listening for prayer chickens constantly and then but you might hear it faster than somebody that's just out there not uh not with without that experience and so it is fun it is it's, it's fun to travel with other friends that have other experiences and uh, you know they're seeing and hearing things that I'm not but do you uh, drive your family and friends crazy uh, cuz you're like wait quiet quiet Everyone, there's a, a such and such somewhere in the vicinity, and they're like, "We don't care, Larkin." Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, the the thing recently that I've uh, driving them crazy about is I got really um, uh, just into these uh, devices that ranchers use to close their gates. They call them cheater bars, and in the ranch country, they have these barbed wire fences. And they have these little bars that they use on the on the post side to to draw that gate tight. Um, and they every rancher welds their own, and so it's almost like their little signature that's out there on all these gates. Well, I started taking pictures. I have 150 pictures of oh, cheater bars man. now. And every time I drive past one, I have to turn the car around and my son and my wife are just like, come on. Rolling their because, eyes. Yeah. So that's – I know that's not bird-related, but it is – it's part of that uh, – you know, I developed that uh, – traveling through ranches on our prairie chicken projects uh, and just noticing that, oh my gosh, everything, everyone, sometimes they make them out of old horseshoes and anything laying around in the barn. And so, yeah, I, I have a tendency to drive people crazy. Well, this is part of I me and all three of uh, the authors that I'm having on this episode, you guys are all uh, people that are working on environmental issues and wildlife and the land. And I think that's something that the type of work that you do is powerful because it puts you out in the land, in the landscape on a regular basis, not just driving across the country or driving through the landscape, but you're out there um, mucking around in the mud day by day, which gives you a sensitivity to be able to see things and notice things that, aside from your academic scientific research, just 
you sure. perceive and see things that the rest of us don't, which I think is really – that's why I, I love talking with, with scientists who spend a lot of time out there uh, in the nitty-gritty of the landscape. Let's talk about birds a little bit. What, what are the birds that really best identify the Great Plains? Or actually maybe what – what are the iconic birds that we should be thinking about? And then maybe yep. give us one not iconic bird that is overlooked on the Great Plains that is, in uh, fact, one we really should be thinking about. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, we'll go with the easy ones first. The, I mean, there are certainly these uh, prairie grouse species, sage grouse, greater and lesser prairie chicken, and sharp-tailed grouse that that – are there so they're maybe a poster child because they're a resident species they spend their time in the great plains in different those those are all found in slightly different regions but they're they're all there and so they and they have these mating displays um and so that they, they give us a behavior to look at and they also are things you know there's pioneer stories and they're part of the history and the culture and uh, they have some and beautiful all, coloring, like they're beautiful birds. Some yes. of them, right? Yeah. And, and especially during these mating displays, the, their air sacs, mm -hmm. um, all, all the different species have slightly different colored air sacs and slightly different ways that they hold their wings out to dance. And, and you can go back even to native American legends and, you know, they were obviously a food species for that, uh, uh for their culture. And, and so just a deep appreciation for those birds on the plane. But do they kind of, fall into this like charismatic megafauna yeah category because <laughs> that's, that's, they're, they're beautiful to look at they're iconic they have weird behaviors so they they really stand out and everyone yeah. thinks oh yeah prairie chickens right Say yeah. yes. exactly and and you know a, they're a target today for ecotourism and i mean they're in some places that uh, many of those species can also be hunted so uh, they're uh, they're appreciated by different people for different reasons, but they're they're out there and they're a uh, they're they're a, a destination for people in many cases. Um, but the Great Plains, I think uh, we spend a lot of time in the book thinking about migration, and so these uh, waterfowl, whether whether it's uh, you know uh, ducks, mallard ducks. Uh, Northern pintail, uh, the snow geese, the Canada geese, the, um, swans that uh, all of these, um, waterfowl that, that migrate. Uh, we talked about the sandhill cranes earlier, you know, so, um, the, the whooping crane as an endangered bird in that case. Um, the, they're, they're, Birds that uh, are that we're, we're known as as this flyway, this very unique flyway that where birds are kind of skipping from our east-west rivers that cross the Great Plains, um, and so so yeah, the migration is a is a really cool. There's a, that any migratory bird I guess we could put in as a, um, and there's there are national wildlife refuges and other hot spots like the Platte River yeah. are places that you can just go see concentrations. And so I guess if you really want to be blown away, um, there's the behavior of the prairie chickens and the other grouse species. And then there's this just kind of big clouds of birds that you see with the migratory birds. And yeah. I want to come back to the migratory birds. Yep. Um, uh, but I want, is, is there a bird that you think is really important that, that doesn't get enough love? Yeah. I mean, so the, uh, one bird that I had a chance to work with this summer, um, on some new projects to me, um, piping plovers and, uh, least terns. And so th these are two birds of conservation concern that, uh, have nested along rivers. And I put these in the kind of the canary in the coal mine, uh, type category. They're, they're birds that, uh, have used this interior part of the country for their breeding grounds. Uh, boy, they're, they're, and they're birds that most people just don't see. Uh, they're, both of them have white, gray, and black markings on them. They're small. Uh, they're what both. What was the like, name of the tern? Uh, the least tern. And so, uh, it's a small tern, as its name <laughs> implies. Um, and they come and breed here, and then they leave and go south. The piping plover hangs out, for example, along beaches along the east coast, east the, the Atlantic coast and the uh, Gulf coast. Um, during this, so we get sightings of birds that are banded here in Nebraska down on those coasts. Mm. And, 
And they're, you know, they're uh, a bird that needs bare sandbars, just like the the uh, sandhill cranes do in the migration time. But these birds need to nest on those bare sandbars. And so, as a uh, as river habitat changes, as we change, uh, you know, uh, irrigation flows and things, this this these birds are kind of in the crosshairs as landscape changes occur. And so those are. Those are two species that, because they're on land but connected to water, in terms of uh, the in the terns case eating fish out of uh, nearby uh, water areas, and the piping plover uh, probes for invertebrates along the shoreline. Um, they're they're tied to water, uh, but they give us a message that maybe things aren't doing as well as they. Uh, should be. And so, uh, you know, and they're also from a birding perspective, they're fun to go look for and they're cuter than I'll get out. Uh, but most <laughs> people are not going to have them on their list of, of birds that they've seen. Yeah. I, I just looked up a picture. This piping clover is an adorable little bird. <laughs> yep. And so uh, it's related to a killdeer that a lot of people have seen a, uh, a common bird. Uh, they're all in a plover group of birds. And, and so they're, uh, sometimes even found with some killed deer. Hmm. Well, I think that's important to think that, especially when some of these un, uh, underappreciated or uh, you know, species, be it birds or others that aren't thought about a lot, are actually the ones that really clue us into problems that we need to be thinking about, ecological issues. Uh, I, w- I was intrigued by this idea um, of migratory birds. Your, your book is in this series of Discover the Great Plains, and so it had me thinking about, you know, Great Plains uh, region and identity and so forth. And it, I did find it somewhat paradoxical that some of the birds that we do think about when we think Great Plains are birds who actually have continental and some hemispheric ranges, that the Great Plains is but one stopover point for these birds that are going all the way up to the Arctic and back. Um, these enormous ranges. Exactly. But for many of them, the Great Plains, uh, these river estuaries and places that they stop over, are essential to their continental m- migratory patterns, correct? That's correct. Yep. So, and we can go back to we've uh, beat sandhill cranes to death here but they're just they they they're a great bird in the storyline that uh, you know they stop here along the Platte River in in Nebraska um partway th- and they also stop uh, in Kansas and in other areas as in South Dakota as they're going north but they they really tend to stop along in in my state of Nebraska for two or three weeks and they're basically uh, getting their insurance policy while they're here in the state. They're uh, fattening up. They're putting on a lot of uh, like literal fat on their bodies because they don't know what their um, breeding ground conditions when they get up into uh, northern Canada. Uh, some of them even lap into Siberia. The ground could be completely frozen when they get up there and their food um, is inaccessible for there's no insects or they, it's hard to probe into that ground for anything. And so they're going to live on that fat for a couple of weeks um, if they find horrible conditions when they arrive. And so if they don't have that stopover site um, in the Great Plains, then that population is going to be in trouble. And the same thing happens with waterfowl as they're slowly making it up into the prairie pothole regions. If, if they don't have some of these more southerly places to, to stop, um, they're going to need food supply. And, and biologists actually, in places like the rainwater basins here in Nebraska, biologists literally uh, estimate how many calories are in a wetland available for birds. That's how, that's how they manage the wetland is, is how many calories are there for migratory birds. And so, so we, you know, you and I may see, oh, that's a nice wetland. But a biologist who works out there looks at like what food is there and how He's many calories. calories. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not to say that these migratory birds are not important to the Great Plains, but we definitely could make the argument that the Great Plains are so important to them. Exactly. And yeah. many of them do, you know, waterfowl start to, 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 uh, kind of fall out of that migratory cloud as they get up to the northern part of the Great Plains. Um, they spend their winters in the southern part of the Great Plains. Um, and so so the Great Plains is certainly – but it's just there's um, – they have many homes yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, during the year and not just one. I do remember when 
I don't know if it was when I was out in Kearney or maybe it was the year right after I left, but um, I heard the story that birders uh, were flying in from all over the country to go out to um, you know Buffalo County because some European crane that is never seen in North America. So people have their little book of North American birds and they're trying to spot right. them all had yep. apparently got mixed up with some sandhill cranes up in the Arctic in Siberia and then traveled right. down here with them. So people were coming from all over to see this, to check off the European crane in their North America book. <laughs> yep. No, yeah. I mean, how many of us have uh, taken the wrong fork on an interstate and like <laughs> in the middle of the night and three hours later, your wife says, where are we? And you're, completely there and i'm guessing that something <laughs> like that happened to that this crane. poor bird shows up ends yeah. up in the wrong continent yeah <laughs> but it does you know and there's uh I, the, we i talked briefly about that in the book too that there's many different kinds of birders and there are some that will drop anything and rush five states away or get a plane ticket and if they you know that they're there for the biodiversity documentation yeah. and they want their life list to be big and other people, and I put myself in this category, just like to go out and see what they can see, but I'm not going to run out to Western Nebraska to see a, a special bird, but I have friends that would. So, uh, we all, we all have our thing. We all have our thing that we really geek out over. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we need to uh, wrap up. If you had to give a suggestion to someone, say on a, on a cross country road trip heading across the plains and they wanted to make a stop, uh, somewhere for a good birding experience. Uh, where would you point them to? What's one of your favorites? And and it, I, I should say at the end of the book, you actually give a list of here's like kind of the top, some top spots to go see. Yep. And so maybe I will hedge my bet because people go across the country, um, you know, like this summer during COVID, there were a lot of people doing cross country walks and bike rides. And it was interesting to see where they cut across the Great Plains. And, uh, and I was actually thinking like, oh, well, they'd be close to this, you know. Um, but one thing that is close no matter where you're going across the Great Plains, if it's in the north in the Dakotas or in the south in Kansas, uh, it, right through the middle in Nebraska, you've got uh, national wildlife refuges that are in all these uh, states. And those were established mostly for migratory bird protection, um, but they're usually fairly large and they're places that are easily accessible to the public. Most of them are free to get into. And um, I would just Google National Wildlife Refuge and see what which one is closest to you as you're going around. And they usually have some kind of like circle drive that you can just take the family car and go around. And uh, they have observation sites. They make it easy for a person to really find those birds easy. That's great. Thanks for that tip. I don't I don't think we've ever – we pull off at a lot of stuff. I don't think we've ever done one to – See some birds or the wildlife at a refuge. So we'll yep. we'll do that next time we're we're driving out your way. Well, uh, thank you so much for spending a little time with us, and thanks for this great book. Uh, I'm really excited about this series on Discover the Great Plains, and I'm glad that there's some books about wildlife uh, in the mix as well. Well, it's great to be a part of a really unique series, and uh, and I, I enjoyed the experience of writing it. Well, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it, Larkin. You take care. Sure. Thanks. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll subscribe and listen every month. Please leave a review on whatever app or platform you're using, or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast, or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Anderson with an O, dot com. I'll go ahead and put that link in the episode description if you didn't catch it. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and just about everything else. So you can direct any praise or critiques my way. I'm associate director of the Red Center and an associate professor of history at Brigham Young University. I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. You can find out more on my website, bwrensink, R-E-N-S-I-N-K, dot org, or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. That's B-R-E-N-D-E-N-W-R-E-N-S-I-N-K. One last plug, if you live in the Intermountain West, check out the Red Center's digital public history project, Intermountain Histories, by visiting intermountainhistories.org, or by downloading the free mobile app, 
by searching for Intermountain Histories on your Apple or Android devices. With this website and mobile app, you can read carefully curated about them, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. Well, until next month, be well, be curious, be kind.